pleasure to be here with you. And, and as you might guess from our family relationship, I uh, also have a long history as a Unitarian, was raised in that tradition. And uh, Frank, you know, to be honest, have not been active in any congregation for many, many years, but it's one of the things, one of the many things I'm really grateful to my parents for raising me in that tradition and feel like it set a great sort of uh, uh, um, course for sort of a, an ethical way of being in the world um, and a compassionate way of being in the world. So I, I, my hat's off to all of you for pulling this fellowship uh, together in in a in a place that I think it's, it's somewhat heroic to have a Unitarian fellowship in Utah, especially. Um, so, uh, and I've heard a bit about it from Ann and Chris. So um, it's great to be here with you this morning. And um, so what I'm going to do is, so a lot of my my life work and professional work has been about sort of trying to revitalize a practice of natural history, which I'll tell you a little bit more about what what I mean by that. I'm sure you're all familiar with the term, but but I specifically this morning want to highlight some of the ways that I think it it dovetails very nicely with some of the kind of intentions of a of a um, uh, practice such as Unitarian Universalism uh, tries to foster in the world of compassion, respect for the rest of the world, mindfulness, uh, and 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 I would even you know use the word you know a spiritual practice in the best sense of 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 that term. So I'm um, just going to run you through some different ideas and, and um, some images here and start by saying that the whole talk will be sort of underlain by a couple of assumptions. Um, uh, one is that the earth is a gift and, and not just a problem. And I think way too often, those of us who care about what's happening in the natural world um, are, are, it's framed in a way uh, this becomes especially obvious around Earth Day and such times that 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 the Earth is 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 a set of problems and there is a set of problems, but I think it's really important to never lose sight of the fact that it's an incredible gift to be living in this beautiful beautiful um, orb in space. And and connected to that is the idea that that I think loving the world is every bit as important as grieving for it. And again, I think uh, much too often we get a little bit hung up in the grief or in the, in the uh, you might say, in the, the half emptiness of the glass rather than the half fullness of the glass as far as our relationship with the world around us. So that's just sort of some background sort of where uh, descriptions of where I'm coming from in general. You know, but this idea of loving the world, some of you may be familiar with this, this notion of biophilia, which was, a, a, you know, literally loving the world, um, which uh, um, the great naturalist E.O. Wilson um, wrote a book by that title a number of years ago, and he defined biophilia as the urge to affiliate with other forms of life. And so in many ways, that's what we're talking about here is how to foster biophilia. Um, and so again, the, the basic idea is uh, here is that, that it, it really matters to love the world. And so uh, to the extent that you um, can, uh, will buy that, then the, um, uh, uh, the question quickly arises in is what, what fosters love of the world? If, if, it, if loving the world is a good and is good for, for both ourselves and the world, then what, is, what kind of things foster that love? Um, and short answer is um, lots of things um, that um, the, uh, and as I say here, there's sort of endless opportunities for love in the, in the world. If we just start to pay attention, slow ourselves down, check out what's around us, just as in the preceding conversation about what's flowering at what time and so on. So again, just, there's just stunning examples of the sort of gift of the world around us all the time. Um, the, uh, you know, again, it, when we stop and take the, take the time to pay attention, um, this is, this is the, uh, marine iguana in the Galapagos that we were just talking about a minute ago. Um, uh, and there's one particular Island has, has these particularly colorful individuals of the species, but you don't have to go down there. This, this image right here was taken not too far from where you all live in Southern Utah, actually. Um, <laughs> And again, sometimes it's just a matter of getting ourselves out and then we um, can be dazzled by, by just um, singular gifts from the world, such as this moment um, and just happen to be in the right place at the right time. 
and it isn't just organisms that that can inspire us like this but but places and landscapes as well many of which um people were talking about as as we were hanging out before we just started a lot of times we connect with these kind of places in groups collectively it's it's becomes it's a it's sort of a collective spirited sort of encounter and then oftentimes uh of course by ourselves as well um, and that's you might say is true for the uh the critters themselves living in the world sometimes it's collective and sometimes it's solitary so i've taken um I'll, I'll give you a couple more formal definitions of natural history in just a moment but but i've sort of uh, colloquially taken to to define it this way as as the practice of falling in love with the world um and that that's really in many ways the point of of attentiveness to the world is to help ourselves be in love with the world these are my my own two children long ago um a colleague of mine uh, coined this term sympathetic observation which i think is a good one and in, in many ways natural history is a practice of sympathetic observation um and um but more formally, what do we mean by natural history? And again, I'm sure if we had, if we were sitting in a circle together uh, in person, I would uh, go around and ask everybody what their what their previous impressions of the term were. But um, I'll just go through a couple of things. So, so first of all, the word, the word, the term natural history was coined about 2,000 years ago in Latin, historia naturalis, and um, one of the interesting things is that in Latin, as in contemporary Spanish, the word historia has two different meanings. One is history in the way we think of that today, but the other is story. So literally, um, uh, natural history means the story of nature, which is a very different thing. A lot of times people have the misconception that it's just about the past. And, and I think uh, nothing could be further from the truth. So the story of nature, but even so, the question is, you know, at any given moment, there's an, an um, infinite number of stories that we could focus on and we could tell. So we make choices all the time about which stories do we choose to pay attention to. You know, there's this is a number of of different people's uh, definitions of what natural history is. Um, don't worry, there won't be a test at the end of this. You're gonna have to memorize this. But the the kind of link through all of these is that it's it involves direct observation um, of the world around us. Um, my own definition, henceforth known as the correct definition, um, is this uh, a practice of intentional focused attentiveness and receptivity to the more than human world guided by honesty and accuracy. So to just break that down a little bit, I mean, the bottom line of that is that natural history is the practice of paying attention, quite simply. And um, just want to highlight that in that way that natural history, you might say, is a verb, not a noun. We oftentimes tend to think of natural history as like museums with dusty specimens on shelves, you know, in 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 um, darkened rooms or what have you. But it's but it, uh, I think much more accurate to think of it as this as a verb, as a practice. It's, it's the actual practice of paying attention to the world around us. And the thing is, we are all. Uh, every person in the world is is born to practice natural history. And I mean that in a really literal sense, from the perspective of evolutionary biology, really, that we are that we're um, our whole evolution of our species was was designed to help us pay attention to the world around us better and better. The, the positioning of our eyes and our ears and our, our senses in general were like a a, a, a uh, an attention pain machine in many ways and and we're born to do this and as i have often said to people if you have any doubt about that then i would challenge you to look at any toddler from any culture in any country in the world and watch what they do and they before they're you know sort of corrupted you might say by by being told by what is or isn't appropriate and we always every person starts out paying close close attention to the world often even tasting it And so we talked a little bit earlier about love and one thing I've been sort of trying to reclaim a little bit and in, 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 in the scientific circles in which uh, I have often traveled. Um, 
love is a word that uh, a lot of scientists get pretty pretty squeamish about using, um, but I think it's actually important that we sort of um, are honest and and reclaim that 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 loving again the world, as I said earlier, is a good and important thing. And and a couple of perspectives on that. This is uh, this quote here. Um, uh, attention is the most basic form of love is from John Tarrant, a Buddhist psychologist who some of you might be aware of. Um, and, um, and from a completely different perspective, the poet and novelist Marge Piercy said almost exactly the same thing. Attention is love. Um, so, and along those lines, um, I mentioned the term mindfulness before. I think natural history, and I, I actually wrote a whole essay about this a while back, um, that, that natural history is a practice of mindfulness. Um, or as I say here, that natural history and mindfulness are two surfaces of the same leaf, a seamless merging of attentiveness outward and inward. So the, the uh, uh, and a psychologist friend of mine once said that, that psychology is simply natural history focused inward instead of outward. So again, a practice of attentiveness, a practice of paying attention. So the history of natural history, kind of interesting. So, so um, I mentioned that, that the term itself was about 2000 years old and that it was coined by, by someone I think that you um, probably all have heard of at least, Pliny the Elder, who lived in the uh, decades immediately um, after the time of Christ. Um, and he assembled um, this set of uh, volumes called Historia Naturalis, which was happened to be also the first ever encyclopedia. It was the first time anyone ever attempted to put down in writing everything that humans knew about virtually everything, a multi-volume thing. And some of it, there's still a penguin uh, edition of, of like in one volume of some of the highlights from that. And some of it is quite prescient even then, but that's again, where the term came from. So the first century AD, but you can, you can delve yep. further back in time. And I, I think Aristotle, for example, who's known as a, for many, many things, but uh, I think it would be fair to call him a, um, a, a great practitioner of natural history as well. So that's a few centuries earlier, but even further back, basically every hunter gatherer culture uh, in the world um, was practicing natural history. That's how it's the practice of attentiveness to the world around us that allowed us and our ancestors to survive, to know which which food, which plants were edible, which were, would kill you, when, when the food animals would be coming through, which valley at which time, which, uh, you know, where, where lurked danger and where uh, was um, a more welcoming kind of habitats. So that's all the practice of natural history. And in, in that regard, you can say that natural history is the oldest continuous human endeavor. Um, in, in fact, you, I think it's fair to say that there have never been people in the world without natural history. And yet, uh, there has never been a time uh, when so few people practice natural history as today, um, at least as small of a percentage of the world population. It, it was a uh, it used to be, you know, just un, um, unimaginable that people wouldn't be paying attention to the world around them uh, in, in careful detail. But now it is, um, uh, uh, of course, um, that's all too common. And I would say that it's um, uh, not coincidental that that is true, that, that, there's a, that natural history is at a low ebb at the time that all sorts of human problems are at high tide. Things like various kinds of social dysfunctions, violence, depression, anxiety, all sorts of things like that are higher than they've ever been at the, at the time when natural history is practiced the least. And I think that, there, that that's not just coincidental. I think there's a direct relationship there. So why does natural history matter? Um, well, one thing I wrote a number of years ago is that we are what we pay attention to. And that's something I, I actually wrote a book many years ago about um, one of the neighboring terrains to you all there about the uh, Escalante Canyon country. And uh, that's where this is from. And I kind of wrote this in a, in a, 
you know, you know, offhandedly at first. And then the more I thought about it, I felt like, well, that is like really, really true. And I've considered it a lot in the, in the many years since I originally wrote that. So, but I think we, we are what we pay attention to. Our consciousness becomes what we choose to focus it on. And so what do we choose to focus it on? So much of the world uh, these days is focused on things like celebrity culture and, and um, uh, you know, the most superficiality that we can conjure up. Um, and of course, more and more and more these days, our attention is taken to the two-dimensional surfaces of things like cell phones and computer screens. And, and you know, I'm as guilty as, as the next person of spending too much of my life. Uh, I mean, we're all looking at a, at a computer screen or a phone right now. And um, so they have great, uh, great value in many ways, but I think they are a danger as well in that they, they're an invitation in many ways to tune out the rest of the world that's beyond that screen. I also have a friend who is, a, is an eco-psychologist and a visual psychologist, and, and she's written about how the actual, the two-dimensionality of a screen, it actually literally changes our perception of what we can perceive, like the brain changes based on what we choose to perceive. And it's, if it's always the same distance from our eyes, and if it's always two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional, over time we see, we literally perceive less and less of the world. So that is a great concern, um, whereas natural history um, inherently gets us shifting scales, looking close, looking far. Um, and I should add the good news uh, involved in that is that it's equally true that um, there's a lot of plasticity in that, in that physiology that I just described. And so if we start refocusing in different kinds of ways that natural history helps us do, the, the brain can adapt to that and we see more again. So of course, any uh, given you know, time and place, we, we can, there's lots of other things besides what's on our screens or on our you know, um, celebrity culture tabloids that we can pay attention to that, that gives us a different perspective of what the world is. Um, this is the Colorado River in the bottom of the Grand Canyon or the details up close um, of a saguaro cactus or, you know, or, or, or so many beautiful things um, that we can pay attention to some lasting only for a moment like this here. So as I've over the years tried to think about kind of how to frame this question of why does natural history matter? I've sort of um, framed it as a as sort of three main um, uh, kind of areas that we might think about um, that it's, that it's, in, uh, it's important in terms of uh, for our science, it's for, our for the, the roots of conservation and ultimately for as the roots of our, of our very humanity. So just quickly, um, uh, looking sort of at all those quickly. So if, if, if we were a group of, uh, of biologists or scientists, I would spend a whole lot of time on, on this here because sometimes in academia these days, natural history was sort of marginalized as being sort of antiquated or quaint or what have you. But in fact, the most profound ecological theories um, and the things that have really changed the, the understanding of the world, things like evolution through natural selection, things like how uh, biological competition works, things like keystone species, all of these things were, uh, the, the theories were developed because of people paying long attention um, as, as committed field naturalists, as this, the picture here is of E.O. Wilson um, uh, looking at ants. Okay, in terms of conservation, or let's just say saving the world, um, natural history matters tremendously there too, because you have to have, uh, you, can't, you can't figure out how to prioritize your conservation work unless you know what's out there, unless you know where the plants and animals live, if, if you know when and where they're there um, and so on. Even something as basic as the Endangered Species Act, you, you, it 
to, to, to propose a species to be protected under the Endangered Species Act requires what amounts to an, a natural history monograph on that species. You have to, to make the case for, for why protection is needed and you can't do that without natural history. And some of our most sort of iconic and, and, and uh, you know, visionary um, conservationists, uh, this is um, from left to right, this is John Wesley Powell, Aldo Leopold and Rachel Carson, all, and many, many others, all very much committed natural historians. And in terms of the conservation work, you know, why does it matter? Well, because there's a growing uh, body of, of psychology research that, that, that uh, makes clear, and this is sort of, it makes intuitive sense too, that people are motivated much more by their feelings than by facts. And oftentimes scientists try to convince people of the importance of something by just barraging with more and more facts, but it's really feelings that um, ultimately make the difference and that motivate us the most. And as this famous scientific work of Harry Potter made clear, you know, love, the, the, the feeling of love ultimately um, overpowers that of fear, or at least in most cases. Another thing that I wanted to point out along these lines is that um, the, the, if you see the sort of paradoxical statement I have here, that environment, the, the word environment is part of the problem for environmentalists. Uh, you know, much of my career, I was a professor of environmental studies, but I have to say that I really don't like the word environmental or environment because it is so dry and abstract. And so it's very, it's a lot easier for people to think about um, uh, the, uh, that it's okay to do things and to change the environment in a way that we might be much more reluctant to change living, breathing organisms or places that we see and that we care for such as, um, this, this is just a glimpse. So you might say that natural history is the solution to this problem. It reanimates the world um, in, by, by, by bringing uh, into motion, into clarity, into, into you might even say, uh, sort of uh, making, oops, um, uh, it, it sort of it just makes the world come alive in a way that that, that is much more in, uh, encouraging for us to take care of it and that we are part of it. So natural history is, I would say, also offers a sort of basis for moral behavior or ethical behavior. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Aldo Leopold, the, the great naturalist writer of the first half of the 20th century. And his, um, his famous book, The Santa County Almanac, um, among others. But in that book, probably the most, probably the most um, influential single article ever written about environmental ethics was his piece called The Land Ethic. And, and these two sentences here is the land ethic when, you, when all is said and done. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And I love the clarity of that. It's right and it's wrong. But he goes on in that same essay to say something else, which is that we can be ethical only in relation to something we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. And I really think that natural history is what provides that for us in a way that, that seeing those dolphins that you just saw promoted a very strong feeling, sense of love, um, you know, something to have faith in and something to care for in a way that some abstract models of quote unquote environment could never do. So I wanted to bring this in, you know, uh, since um, we're all Unitarian Universalists on this bus, um, I, it, it, this, uh, I, I went back and looked at the, at the, the sort of formal um, principles of of the tradition um, as they're currently articulated. And the seventh UU principle really jumped out at me, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And um, certainly uh, I think it's pretty easy to see how this practice of attentive natural history that I've been talking about is a way of fostering um, that respect for 
that interdependent web and to understand it as well. And along the um, uh, the line, those same lines is is that it it develops a sense of kinship. Um, uh, and this is just something I wrote recently um, that that the sense of kinship is a natural byproduct of our evolutionary heritage that I mentioned before about paying attention. Um, and this is, by the way, is from there's a you might be interested in this project, something called the Kinship Project, which comes out of um, a, a neat organization called the Center for Humans and Nature, which is based near Chicago. And they just they just released a. a uh, a, a set of five vol small volumes of different people sharing ideas about kinship um, that I think you might find of interest. That's what this is from. So a number of years ago, you know, I, I taught, um, uh, you know, undergraduates, natural history and the general public in some cases as well for many, many years, for about three decades or more. And um, I started um, one year just asking students, I, I, every spring for many years, I taught a, a sort of foundational natural history field course. And on the last day of the class, um, sitting in a beautiful canyon, I asked students, you know, what, um, how had this affected them? And I just started taking notes on that and then did that a bunch of years. Uh, and sort of sort of gathering social data, you might say, about how the practice of natural history was affecting people's lives. And these are some of the things that I came, uh, that, that sort of reverberated again and again, and I'll go through some of these here. So humility, I think, is a huge one. That, that natural history, the more we learn about the world around us, the more um, the more humble we become. And of course, if we're, if we're on a sandbar in Alaska and see fresh grizzly tracks like we see here, humility is, is pretty, uh, uh, not a choice, it just happens. Um, but, um, and it happens in many other ways. Like one day with my students, I was out in the Gulf of California and suddenly we were surrounded by a pod of orcas, um, which um, one of the most profound um, days of my life, actually, they were with us for about four hours, and one of the individuals was about the size of our boat. Um, so we were very vulnerable, and it was a, uh, became a, a moment of communion with another species. But again, humility, uh, the day was infused by humility. Um, and, um, or this here... <laughs> Um, the person in the center there is a good friend of mine who happens to be a sort of world famous herpetologist and he's in Africa here, South Africa with a python. Of course, my, I think most of our reaction, including mine, when you see a gigantic snake like this would not be to crouch in is clo closer and closer. But anyway, for herpetologists, that's what you do. And, um, but again, humility uh, in the face of these great presences. And of course, given the politics of our time and just the social world of our time, you know, humility is something much too often in short supply. And so um, infusing more humility in and of itself could go a long way towards, towards um, social change. And of course it can be, it doesn't just have to be big fancy um, animals, it's just places like this, not too far from you. Um, that can can uh, just reverberate a sense of of timelessness, or um, moments where you hear suddenly in the in the mist in Alaska hear this of a humpback whale, or this is in the sub Antarctic, and this blue blue ice is something that's only rarely seen, and it's because it was compressed so far down and the and the in underneath. A glacier that all of the air bubbles has been compressed out of it and and suddenly you know every once in a while one gets released so natural history then inspires us and and inspire remember literally means to breathe in and so natural history helps us you might say breathe in the world around us and one thing I think that has always been so striking to me, having been around people doing this for so long, is that it engenders joy. That that so often um, at the ends of days of doing natural history or being out in the field or whatnot, it's like I, I began to notice that so often my jaws would be sore from just smiling and laughing so much as you see some of the folks doing here. 
and in this in this along these lines um, of of inspiration humility and so on the natural history can give us sort of an expanded sense of self that that the boundaries of me doesn't stop just with me but that i am part of this larger ecological self in the world and that in is a way of becoming more compassionate and compassion meaning um, to feel with something else or some the rest of the world so natural history fosters hope and again this is one of the characteristics of, of what i uh, would hear repeatedly from my students um, and there's just um, so many examples of beauty of, of fascination examples for how to do things how to design homes and so on all based on on, on ecological examples we find through the practice of natural history a whole nother topic and really a whole nother talk we could have sometime is that is that natural history is healing and that that healing is reciprocal um, uh, uh, just before the pandemic my organization the natural history institute hosted a a national conference um, in Sedona, Arizona, um, called Reciprocal Healing, and um, bringing together pra health practitioners and naturalists and and many other people, and um, the idea that 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 the healing of ourselves and the healing of the world around us are reciprocal and reinforce one another, um, and. There's a huge literature about this, which again, if in a different context, I might go into every one of these points in more detail. Um, but there's um, uh, a lot of medical and physiological literature as well as psychological research literature, um, kind of providing empirical um, evidence of everything that it says here. Uh, also, if you're interested, I was a co-editor of a special issue of the professional journal Ecopsychology, which was all devoted to this idea. Uh, but again, it's a fascinating topic. So natural history isn't just science. Um, it, it involves the arts and the humanities and the sciences all kind of in an integrated whole. And, um, and Patty Ann Rod Rogers is a wonderful poet. Um, and I love this that she said long ago, without artistic expression, any fact remains alien uh, with no reverberations in the soul. Or as Rachel Carson said, when she was awarded the National Book Award um, for her wonderful book, The Sea Around Us, she said, no one could write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. So some of you may be uh, familiar with Barry Lopez, wonderful writer who just passed away just over a year ago. Um, and he, among his many wonderful books, was a was a um, a book that was ostensibly for children, um, but um, called Crow and Weasel. It was a fable, and in the, one of the characters in that story said this: "Was sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive." And again, the, the tradition of storytelling and the importance of storytelling and story cultures throughout cultures in all times and places is well documented. And so one then might ponder what kinds of stories do we t tend to share about um, the world around us? And as ecological scientists, I think too often we're guilty of telling ecological stories in ways that are not particularly compelling, certainly to the general public. And I don't mean to say that <clears throat> um, research papers like are, like I have on the screen here are not of great value in many ways, but they, it's not the whole, it shouldn't be the whole presentation. Where in fact, the most compelling ecological stories are often rooted in natural history, like real stories of real beings in real places, not just abstracted. Okay, so I thought I would just end with sharing um, a short little reading, um, and um, then we can um, have discussion if, if there's interest in that. So a few years ago, I guess it's now coming up on five years ago, I, um, we released this book, uh, Nature, Love, Medicine, and um, it's an anthology um, where many, 20 some writers uh, addressing um, 
how this idea of healing and nature um, and how wildness and wellness within us are connected. And so I was just going to read to you uh, from the ending of my introductory chapter in the book. And, and this, this particular story, by the way, um, the, took place very close to where you are right now. It's the final night of a week-long group backpack into Red Earth. After a late supper and lingering conversation, two of us lay back, stunned into horizontality by the night sky. In this canyon of smooth stone deep in the heart of one of the largest roadless areas in North America, our eyes gaze intently where they rarely focus, upward. The dome of stars is phenomenally textured with vast depth, depth visible within the Milky Way. Swirls and eddies of pulsating light contrast with the velvet black of infinity. Arcing downward, the gaudiest shooting star I've ever seen blazes brilliantly for a full 20 seconds as it angles toward Earth. Its long tail remains gleaming even after I close my eyes. It's a brief interlude of extended psyche as our minds momentarily stretch beyond their usual boundaries, a sense of delighted union with the larger forces of not only this world of green, but the universe that surrounds it, and better for sharing it with a close friend. Lying face up to the heavens, dazzled, humbled, entranced by the endless array of light, provokes a fundamental feeling of kinship with people through times and cultures. We all look up and wonder. And on these sandstone slabs in front of this long inhabited alcove near thousand year old petroglyphs and discarded clay pots, we see the same framing of the universe as our ancestors unchanged through human time, but for the occasional steady scoot of a tiny satellite's light. In these singular moments, we are the outbreath of galaxies. Thank you.